What's going on, guys? Bonafide Hustler here. Hopefully, you can hear me uh, loud and clear. Let me know. Just running this off a different camera and mic right now. Uh, this is basically an open Q&A show, the best way to sell on eBay. So let's kind of keep the topic like pretty much on eBay. But you can ask me questions on anything else, maybe uh, hotshot oriented or maybe the videos that I put on YouTube. I'd be glad to answer your questions. Was not able to do a hotshot today. I had a lot of things to take care of. And I think next week might be one of those weeks where I do a lot of things and maybe get one or two days to do a hotshot. But either way, I hope you guys are enjoying my channel, my videos. And uh, yeah, it, it takes a long time to edit them, but it seems like you guys really enjoy them. Um, <laughs> anyways, so what else we got here? Okay, so I'm gonna say hi to uh, Bowie. We have Randy, we have Nick K. What's up, Jenemy, Adam A517, Nevermore, Philippe. So if you're catching this live, that's even better because then you can ask questions live. Ooh, wow, I just got an offer for 150 bucks on a $40 backpack. I, I'm gonna have to deny that. In fact, I'm gonna deny that right now because actually I'll probably do, hold on real quick. So yeah, I just got an offer in, weird. Um, I should probably take care of this after the show. Wow, yeah, that, that's not even like a good offer. Anyways, okay, so I'll take care of that later. But um, I wanna take care of uh, answering your guys' questions and stuff. Sorry, I got sidetracked with a stupid offer thing on my eBay thing. Um, but I do wanna answer some of the questions that are coming through my uh, videos. So I have a video pulled up here. There was a quick question here. So while I wait for your questions to come in, I'm gonna read some questions that are coming from my videos. Um, here's one, how do I buy the clear bags that you put your products in? So I think what they mean by that is, okay, so the clear bags, what's up, Steven Fielder? Thank you for the super chat, man. That is awesome. <laughs> we got a $50 super chat from Steven Fielder. I appreciate that, man. You are definitely like super chat king on my channel. So the question is, how do I buy the clear bags that you put your products in? Okay. So there's a difference between clear poly bags and poly bags. And when it comes to clear poly bags, um, I like to get the ones with the suffocation label already printed on them. Uh, you can find those all over the place, but I like them in the uh, I like them in the dimensions of nine by fourteen. I think that's what I'm. Yeah, I usually get nine by fourteen. You can cut them in half. You can do all kinds of stuff. But nine by fourteen clear is definitely what you want to be looking for. I also have poly bags that are opaque. You can't see through them. Um, eBay makes them. That's great. But I also just got some off of Amazon. I think they're pretty cheap. It was maybe sub 20 bucks for a hundred of them. And it's a nine by 14 or it might be 11 by 14. I think so it's one, it's this, it's a really big poly bag. I can go measure it if you guys uh, want me to, but either way, uh, yeah, you want to get the largest poly bags possible. That way you can kind of cut them in half if you need to alter them in some weird way. Um, what kind of packaging tape do I use? I just use normal 36 rolls of tape that I buy off of eBay typically. Um, and that's pretty much it, just clear packing tape. Nothing nothing really to it. There's no special tape to it. I did go with the eBay Super Pack uh, two months ago, and I tried that out, and it gave me some really cool boxes and some cool poly bags and poly mailers, um, and it gave me three different colors of eBay tape. I got six rolls, didn't last very long, and uh, I, while I liked it, I don't think it's really necessary. I think the eBay Super Pack is kind of overpriced. So I think it was like $60 Super Pack. I used my entire store, store coupon on it, and I can't say it's really worth it. But anyways, all right, so what's going on, guys? All right, so here's one question. Randy at the Flip Monkeys, what's the next guide going to be? It's a really good question. Uh, you guys can go ahead and guess that down below. I'm pretty sure people have figured it out by now. But yeah, I'm working on a guide. It is going slower than normal just because I need to find the time and carve it out and hit this thing as hard as possible. But the good thing is um, the actual progress the initial progress has been the initial stage has been completed which is the intro and the flow is now easy to do like the, it's just about going into pictures dragging pictures in, altering them explaining the product that kind of stuff so it's not too bad anyways uh adam a517 says chris is getting close to getting that surfboard i am i'm telling you people like steven fielder here uh with a 50 dollars super chat i mean this surfboard here's the thing i do right uh, because I think YouTube takes X amount of the money that comes through Super Chat. So I basically look at whatever Super Chat that is, and I take 70% uh, of the Super Chats that I see, and I put them into this box that is like in the corner right here. You might have seen it in one of my videos. Okay, so I just take the money from my account, and I throw it into that box right there. And then, of course, Google AdSense pays me plus the Super Chat money at some point of the month. But as, I just always remember what I get paid per show and I put it up there. Buy a super awesome surfboard um, and it, hell, if there's enough money left over, maybe maybe I'll buy e-money one too. I don't know, we'll see. Okay, so I'm looking for more questions. If you have any more questions, 
right here regarding eBay or processes and all that kind of stuff, let me know. I'd be glad to help you out. Jeremy has a question right here. Do you have a budget when you do hot shots? No, I don't because in this town, I don't, I don't know if I go through a hot shot day really spending more than a hundred bucks. Like I think that's like the cap, not the cap, but that's usually the most I would ever spend on a hot shot day. But I do not have a budget just because if I can make money on something, I'm not going to leave it in the store for someone else to make money on it. It's just not my thing. Um, okay. Hawaii Entrepreneur Podcast. When's the next thrift battle? Actually, to be honest with you, I have to get through the green room meetup first before I can even think about the thrift battle stuff. Um, it's really important. While you know we live in a digital age, and I can do conference calls with you know my pals, Steve Rakin, Eric Spears, the College Picker. Um, it you, there's just really no substitution to having people like right there in person, which they'll be staying at my house pretty soon. And there's just so many more more ideas that you can bounce off each other. It's just a lot more fun that way. So. Um, I can imagine that the uh, Thrift Battle Season 2 is going to be epic. And, uh, yeah, just keep watching my channel, and I'll let you know. As it, as it unfolds, you'll see it on my blogs. Um, okay, so what other kind of questions do we have here? I've been looking for some on my, uh, on my vlogs here. There are always questions, like, left and, le left and right, and, it's, and I, I can never answer all of them because I'm just so busy. Um, here's one. Who's thumbs down in your videos? Come on, be nice, people. I don't know who's thumbs down in my videos. I probably run a 5% dislike rate, sometimes 10, and quite honestly, I don't care um, because that's just, why, why should I care about that? That is not my deal. I do not care. Okay, let me go to another video and see uh, what's going on here. So if you have a question, let me know. I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can on this, uh, uh, you know, on this show right here. Um, all right, so Limited Play says, Goodwill employees are destroying eBay. They keep all the good stuff for themselves and provide bad word service to customers on eBay. In other words, they drive customers away from eBay being crappy sellers. Look, man, Limited Play, I would not let something like that like ruin the whole resale game for you. That's just someone, there, there's so many people on eBay that mess things up, it's not even funny, and that do but really bad customer service. Just like anything else in the world, whether you have a bad boss or something like that, eventually the bad boss, but a good company gets purged out, right? And this kind of, you know, you can only do that so many times and provide bad service before eBay starts cracking down on you. It doesn't matter if you are a small account to a big account, they're going to crack down on you, just like Amazon cracks down on people that are small all the way to large. So there's only so many times you can do that on the platform and then they will see it. So I wouldn't let that bother you. Just stay on the course, find awesome cheddar and resell it for good money. Um, Britta J says, will I be attending eBay open? I will not. Do I recommend going? I've never been, so I, I don't know, but it sounds like a lot of fun. It's in Vegas. I mean, how could it not be fun? Um, yeah, so I will not be there. I've got things to do this summer. It's just, it is what it is. Rafa Remedios, what happened to the Bob Damn channel? The Bob Damn channel is alive and well right now, honestly. Um, it's doing okay. It's not, it hasn't really... In fact, if you look on Social Blade, it's actually spiked pretty hard. So the Bot Damn channel just needs content, and that's what I am trying to carve out time for because it's very difficult to make content for both channels. So, um, yeah, but that's coming around very soon. I got word today that my private label thing has passed the, tr the, the toughest part of a trademarking process, so I'm so pumped about that. Um, yeah, I, we're pretty. I'm almost there, so that's going to be a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, okay, let's see uh, some other questions. Let me know. I'm looking into these questions here. Um, there are enough questions coming down through here, so let me actually uh, let me actually answer some of them for you guys. All right, Terry Hansen, who's a better thrifter, you or E Money? Look, I trained my brother. Let's just put it that way. I won't say who's better than who. He's good at he's good at certain things. I'm good at many things. So uh, he's good. He he just needs he needs to learn a little bit more, but it's not a big deal. Um, okay, let me get some more. Okay, so here's one from the Hawaii Entrepreneur Podcast. Would you ship big things like a mixer that weighs twenty pounds if it makes you hundred dollars profit? Yes, I would. Typically, when I ship something that's that big, I try to move it locally first. So uh, I had a. What was it called? A Margaritaville, like three stage mixer thing with three blender things on it with a rotating kind of spout that puts the ice where it needs to be, makes the drinks, all that kind of stuff. Now that thing on Amazon at the time was like 350 bucks. I think I bought that one 
for 40, maybe 70. I cannot remember at this point. Uh, it was at a garage sale. And then I sold it locally for, I think it was 150 or 200, right? I could have put it on eBay for maybe 219 or so, but the thing was gigantic. You know, the chances of it breaking were high. And I would much rather take a guaranteed 150 than an iffy 210 or something like that. Does that make sense? Like, because the iffy 210 still hasn't taken into account the eBay fee, which is probably around $21. And then it hasn't taken into account the PayPal fee, which is probably another 3%. And it hasn't taken into account the shipping, which is probably 30 bucks. And then the chance of return, which is always looming. So I'd much rather take a one and done on Craigslist. Um, and that's just how I think. So, all right. Reseller niche, uh, brother versus brother thrift battle. Yeah, maybe one day. I mean, he's going to be on it for sure. Do I ever pick up flawed bags to repair, even if it's enough profit or just pass altogether? This is from Justin Packman. It's a really good question regarding bags, um, which is kind of like a big spotlight kind of thing right now that I've uh, been talking about because not only do I have a bag guide out, but I've been hustling bags for many, many, many years. It's not like I just started hustling bags and I realized like, oh my God, there's an opportunity to make a guide and make some money. It's not like that. I've been hustling bags for many, many, many years. And in fact, 99% of the pictures that are in my bag guide are my pictures. And uh, yeah, I had this. That's the reason why the shoe guide is going to take so long because I've been sh hustling shoes since 2004 or something like that. So you do the math, going through all those hard drives and pulling the right pictures to get my point across and all that kind of stuff. That's why it's going to take a much longer time. Now, the guide is probably going to cost a little bit more. I ain't going to lie to you because it's going to take, it's, it's already taken so much time to sort. So I can, it's probably going to cost a little bit more, but it's also an item that you'll be finding more of. Like I find more shoes than I find bags, but I find bags a really steady amount. I find shoes at a higher rate than I do bags. If you watch my channel, you know, I pop on shoes. I'm popping on, I've been popping on shoes like every vlog since, you know, since I started the channel, basically. Um, Nevermore Antiques, $10 super chat. Thank you very much. First of all, that's amazing. So we got some more surfboard funds coming my way. Thank you so much. I guess the, the good thing about it is in July, and I think I'm going to take a trip out in July, just like a short weekend trip. I think that's the trip where I buy the board, and then I return in August for a week, and then I can really shred it up real good. I've never really been able to buy a new or a really amazing used surfboard because to me, sometimes the price is just, didn't justify it coming out of my pocket. But the fact that I can probably do it this year is amazing because pretty much none of that came from my pocket. It just came from little local flips and stuff and a lot of super chats. So that's good. And I'm really proud of that because it's like I'm working hard, making vlogs. And, you know, if all I get out of five years of making vlogs is some cool AdSense and a surfboard, I am like totally happy. Uh, plus the fact that I got to meet some amazing people and host the meetups, it's already been really worth my time. So um, I really want to, yeah, we're going to be vlogging that whole surfboard thing. So yeah, there's going to be active stuff coming on my channel in a couple months uh, regarding a beach. And I think it's going to be amazing. So uh, so thank you so much for the super chat. And Nevermore Antique says, you inspired me to start my own channel. I love you. I love who you are, man. Here's some cash to fuel the spaceship. Good looking in that surfboard. Thank you so much, Nevermore Antiques. That is awesome. Uh, I, pre I appreciate it. Um, G. Jasso says, Chris, have you ever hustled air zone gun? I don't know what an air zone gun is. I don't know what air soft gun is, but I don't know about an air zone gun. So um, I don't know. I don't quite know. As of right now, no. But I don't know if air zone means air soft to you. Um, have I ever considered retail arbitrage at stores like Target or Walmart? I've done it before. Um, and it's good during certain times of the year or during store resets or clearance of an entire shelf or section of the store. Maybe a store just is thinning out electronics or you know how sometimes uh, stores go through resets. They just they just basically sometimes allocate more space for something rather than something else. So case in fact could be video games in Target, for example. When the video game department was this big, you know they were starting to sell out of a lot of stuff. They didn't have a lot of stuff in stock, and they uh, they just realized through demo, you know, demographics and all that kind of stuff of people buying whatever they wanted that they were lacking in some of the video game stuff. So what they did is they did a store reset. Basically, they enlarged the video game part and they shortened down like the cell phones, not the cell phones, but the, the home phones, like those 2.4 gigahertz, stupid, you know, Panasonic and unit unit phones that nobody buys. But that was part of the store. So they shortened down something like that. They might shorten down the printer section 
uh, they might shorten out something else. But either way, there has to be a store reset. Like, so they reset some things. Things go over to clearance, which at the last store reset that I ever participated in, uh, that was not a Q4, was like two years ago when Targets were pushing out their phones, like their Panasonic phones and stuff. And they were marking them like 60% off and you could get into just about any one of them. Send it into FBA and make $30 a pop. So I remember that. Um, I've done it before. It's just not my primary thing. It's not that it doesn't make me happy. It's just that I really do think the retail arbitrage game is getting really hard to do, and it's been hard for the past couple of years. Um, now, if you go around the country chasing down stores that are closing and this and that, it could be profitable. I can still see it. But as an everyday going to Walmart, Target, uh, and these big box stores, it's getting harder and harder. People are getting pinched, and now you see a lot more people incorporating eBay and Poshmark and other income streams because I think they feel it too. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the game evolving, you know? Um, you can't expect something to be amazing forever unless you are in direct control of the project itself. And so that's the reason why I am really going a little bit harder into the workout thing, or at least de developing the strategy to hit the workout channel as far as I can. Um, developing a private label brand behind the scenes that not many people know about, but it's being developed. Um, one of the products is right there. You can kind of see it on the shelf. Um, but yeah, I just want to be in control of things, you know, so that's pretty much it. Um, okay, let me get some questions down. So thank you, yeah, for the super chats that I've seen so far. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let me go here. Let me go, let me see if I can get them all answered for you guys. Uh, Justin Packman, do I ever pick up flawed bags to repair it or, 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 okay, or do I, okay, do I ever pick up flawed bags to repair if it's enough profit? I never answered this question. Or do I just pass it all together? It just depends. Like a... Okay, here's, here's a perfect example of a flawed bag. It's actually in the bag guide. Sold for really good money. Um, it was a C.C. Filson uh, leather garment. No, no. Canvas garment bag, soft garment bag. Uh, I mean, it smelled like hell. It smelled like grease. It smelled terrible. It had grease marks all over it. Like it just been like drugged through an airport tarmac, you know? Um, but that bag right there, it uh, sold for like, what, 329 or some crazy amount, something like that. And I think I was into it for... 20 or maybe 30 bucks it wasn't you know it was an estate sale thing i think and uh yeah that one had issues it had no structural issues and that's a di that's a different story when it's a structural issue like a missing uh clasp that's not too bad but like a missing or a hole in the fabric even if it's ripstop nylon that's probably a deal killer um you'll see on the bad guide like things that i kind of avoid like fraying ends if i can't snip it off with a really small pair of scissors i don't get into it so Anyways, um, <sighs> all right, let's see here. Yeah, but certain things like a CC Filson with flaws is still good, you know? All right, um, what else we got here? Question, question, questions. Oh, here's a good one. Um, Michael W., do you not care about being a top-rated seller and why? This is a really good question because last month I became above, sell what is it, the one right below it? I became above standard. I think that's what it's called. Anyways. Um, did, did it affect me in my head? You know, does it affect my hot shots? No. Did I lose my top rated seller status? Yeah, probably for a month. I did. The next evaluation period, I think, is on the 20th. So maybe I'll get back to TRS again. Uh, the reason why I lost my TRS is because of back in January when I started the Road to 200 thing, I went into my garage and I started purging a couple things. I didn't tell you guys about it, but I was on the fence of purging like 40 items, right? But I got really irritated and I purged like five and like i think about five or ten the problem is when i took him off when i took him out of my garage and i you know opened up the zip the, the bags and i dumped them into a crate so i could take it to savers and just donate it and get it right off um i did not pull the listings i forgot to so there's at least five and i realized it in april when some of these items were starting to sell and i didn't have them it was really tough the crazy part is i got good feedback on all of them right even though i never shipped the item off it's just a way that you word the thing. I had just, just a way to do it. But I got back with the buyer immediately like, hey, sorry, I don't have this thing. But if I have it, I will send it to you free of charge. Like that was just basically the verbiage behind it. But attacking uh, that as soon as it comes down, because, you know, when you get confronted with something and you can't find something, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. You're kind of like, oh, God, you know, like I thought my business was going, was going strong, but clearly something is wrong. Like something, I can't find this item. This is terrible. I'm starting to invest some time looking for this thing. It's not good. Um, 
So I didn't have the item on, I think, three different occasions. Yeah, and I forgot to just, while I was purging it out, to take it off my eBay store. I just literally just took it to Savers, got a 30% off coupon, things, to, you know, and I was just thrifting again. So I lost it. I to get it back. Not a big deal. Uh, that's what I think is the true cause. Uh, Brian Eng, 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 I guess that's his name. I'll just say Brian. What's up? My contribution for the surfboard for all the help and money you've given me since I've started this journey. Uh, 10 bucks. Thank you, Brian. That is amazing. Man, it's getting so hot in this house. Hold on real quick. I have got to put this AC down. Whoa. One second, guys. All right. Man, it's getting super hot. Close the window. All right. Um, Okay, so thank you so much, Brian, for that super chat. Some more questions. Let me get this out. Oh, cool. So here's one. Abdel Malik, BEO. What are the steps to private label? Well, the way I'm doing it is completely different than most people's private label. And the way I'm doing it is probably the hardest way possible. But I uh, I will explain it a little bit further when it 100% is at where it needs to be. So right now, infrastructure is already built. Everything's ready to go. I got a word from the attorneys the other day that it's pretty much clear. There's a certain period that has to pass by and that it's like literally like 100% clear. So like right now it's like 99.9% .9 clear. It's very, very close to final. It's in final stage basically. So um, right now there's just a, there's a one stage called like opposition stage, which is super rare for someone to like provide opposition, but right now it's probably never going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's the way I'm basically creating a brand. Like I'm not creating some anchor brand that's going to go on Amazon and then Amazon cuts me out, you know, one day. No, what I'm creating is actually a real brand and it's going to be a little bit more fitness clothing oriented. So anyways, that's what's going on. I've been working on that for a year. And in fact, it's been a, ex almost exactly a year because the last meetup in July last year was when I got my very first shipment of hard goods of things that I had gotten produced. So part of it came from the Orient. I'll just say the Orient, it's from the East. Um, part of it came from USA. Then I got it assembled here. And uh, yeah, so pretty awesome stuff. Really, really hard stuff to do. I would not, once I get it all done, I'll explain it to you guys. Okay, any help? Okay, here's, here's a good one. Carlos Marufo, any help on how to best sell espresso machines? I pick up quite a few but no sales. I pick up Seiko, Breville, Starbucks. All right, so the Starbucks one is good. Breville ones are, eh, not so much. Uh, Seiko, Seiko's pretty good. I have a Seiko over here that I'm like still contemplating whether I want to keep it or not. Um, I paid 50 for it. It's probably worth about 300. Um, there's some other good ones out there. Uh, Gagia, G-A-G-G-I-A -G -G is pretty good. Jura is really good. But um, are there any tips? Yeah, you're gonna have to test it. And you're gonna have to test it and make sure the boiler works. You have to test it and make sure that if it's an all-in-one machine, it has these little elevator type of things inside. You have to make sure all those things work. And, uh, you know, it takes the the coffee, if it has a, its own coffee grinder inside, you have to make sure that it, you know, the grinders work, that the grinders put the ground coffee into the percolator. And once that's done, the percolator goes up the little elevator thing, shoots it down into a cup that you can pull out and dump out coffee grounds. So the all-in-one machines, like the higher Jura and Seiko ones and all those are a little bit harder to test. The easiest ones to test are going to be your Starbucks machines, the, the barista, you know, machine that sells so well on eBay. That one's much easier to test because it's like three buttons and a percolator and that's it. So those three buttons activate uh, on and off. The other one activates the steam. And then the other one, I think, activates the drip. If I'm not mistaken, it's the drip. So yeah, it's super, super basic. Um, as they get more complicated, there is more testing involved and you're going to have to, uh, there might be dual reservoirs in there, like one for milk, one for uh, water. There might be, um, you know, dual grinders. I mean, it starts getting really crazy and you're just going to have to test it. And having the manual there, whether you get it digitally, like through PDF, you're going to have to look through the manual too, which is probably going to be in like eight different languages because all these really good uh, espresso machines are sold in so many different countries. So the translations are all over the place. Um, but I like hustling them. I'll be honest with you guys. I was actually looking at one yesterday uh, for $300 in perfect working condition. It was on eBay for $2,500. $2, 
um, with a couple selling at $2,200, but this one had issues and it was $300. It was a Jura uh, espresso machine from a Goodwill. And I was like, Phew. it's a little, you know, it was an all-in-one as well, which is crazy. So I was like, okay, I could take it home, test it. I still have seven days, but I'm like, I don't want to abuse Goodwill like that. I want to, I want to take it home, test it. It doesn't work and I can't sell it on eBay as broken. Morally, I just don't feel right about bringing it back to Goodwill. So I either need to get into it really, really low to where if it doesn't work, I absolve, you know, like the risk is mitigated completely. I just don't feel good about testing something. It doesn't work. I list it and then no interest within seven days. Then I just return it. It's just, I don't know. I don't feel good about that. It's bad hustler karma. Um, okay. So let's uh, see some more questions here. Um, go ahead and answer. I mean, if I hadn't seen your question, go ahead and, um, Go ahead and ask it right now. I don't see how many people on the show. I can't even tell. 84 viewers. All right, cool. And tell all your friends, too, about the Bonafide Hustler channel. Seriously. Uh, Bowie Cell is saying, I see an espresso guide in the future. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do an espresso guide. I think after this next guide that I'm doing, I might do a random Bolo's gu uh, guide, which is just going to be completely, completely random stuff. And I like that because I, my pictures are so random, even from 2004 all the way up to current day. And I am, I am missing 32 gigs of pictures. I don't know where they're, where they are, but that is one thing I am missing. But either way, like the randomness is really fun. And it's like, I'd like to have, make a guide that has randoms in it because you can still make money with randoms. I mean, as long as it piques your interest, you remember it for maybe a couple days, weeks, months, and then you, you see it at a garage sale or you see it at a thrift store. I think a random guide would completely help out as well. Um, okay. Henry S says, I would bring it back if it was over 40 bucks. But may, maybe I'm weird like that. I just don't, I just don't want to uh, use Goodwill because I, I don't want to abuse Goodwill. Let's put it, I use Goodwill to make money, but I don't want to abuse Goodwill to make money. I don't think that's right. Um, yeah, you're right. Philip Boyer says you could do a 100 items to resell, but a gold version. I could. I might. And it's just completely possible. Um, Lori, I have the bad guide. I really like it. Thank you. Do I have an available one list page one? Okay. Do I have an available a one page list with all the brands? Um, no, I don't. Um, that's probably, that's a really good suggestion. You know, that's the thing. When I build these guides, I build them to what I think is going to be just right. And then I get feedback at the end and then I've gotten feedback at least five good things that I can do for this next guide. So I will try to do it on the next guide, although it's going to be tough. It's going to be really, really hard to shoes are much harder than bags, not to flip, but there's just so many more of them. So if I put a list of shoes that I, like pique my interest, I mean, I guess I can make that. It's just going to be a big list. Um, New subscriber here, Natasha. What is up, Natasha? Good to see you. Thank you for joining. Um, Joe Molina, what's the most important thing to know about time-restricted eating? Uh, Joe, that's a good question. I don't know if it's quite for the eBay show, but uh, if you're talking about intermittent fasting, um, the most important thing, I think, in intermittent fasting is to, make sh to hone in on your eating window. Some people have eight or 10 hours. Um, but essentially, all you're doing is taking the same calories or a slightly deficit in calories and pushing it in that eight or 10 hour window. So I do intermittent fasting. I've been doing it for two years. I think it's, I think the benefits are profound. I love it. It's super convenient. And yeah, I just really enjoy it. Although sometimes you can get kind of hungry sometimes every now and then you can get pretty hungry, but uh, in the morning I don't have food for like the first four or five hours, which is pretty neat. Um, yeah, but it's, it's good. I can honestly say, I don't know if it's my workouts that are keeping me in really super, super good shape or the intermittent fasting is actually burning fat like it's supposed to do. Um, but like, I don't know. I feel good. I feel like I'm cruising around in a body that is like a 20 year old. So I don't know. That's just what I feel like. It feels good. Strong. You know, I can do things, which is cool because that's sometimes that doesn't go hand in hand. Sometimes people just have strength and aesthetics. But when it comes down to like riding a bike or getting on a snowboard or a wakeboard or surfboards like they cannot perform you know and I, I just don't see the point of having you know an amazing physique or somewhat be somewhat strong if you can't propel your body from point a to point b i just don't see it so that's also one of the catalysts 
of my private label brand is that feeling and that knowledge. Anyway, so it's a little off eBay topic. Okay, um, let's take a look at this next question. Mr. Roboto, do I use a sanitizing spray on the inside of shoes? I don't. I don't. Most of the shoes that I get do not have any kind of smell. Um, <clears throat> what else we got here? Thriller Gorilla Pickle. Chris, we need a quick flip guide. Yeah, that would be a good one. It's not a bad suggestion. Um, what else we got here? Uniquely me. I was already into flipping bags, but your guide has taught me some new brands. Great job. Everyone should have the guide. Hey, thank you, Uniquely Me. Good to see you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> never more antiques. Chris makes me want to go to the gym, but Ben and Jerry's makes me want to go sit in my recliner. Ha <laughs> ha. Hey, honestly, this is what most people think. Most people think that if you are you know, waking up early and working out and doing intermittent fasting and all this kind of stuff and being active that you can't have junk food. The, the reality is you can do a lot of things that you didn't think you can do. Like the other day, I had pizza three times this past week. Um, I had ice cream once, I had donuts once, um, you know, and I might have gained two, maybe three pounds total. I don't know, not very much, right? But the point is once you learn how to control uh, your physique, and once you work hard to achieve a good physique, you can undo a little bit of it at a time if you want to, but right? As long as you know, have the knowledge to get back to square one and do better, like you're fine. So I don't want people to think like, oh, it's just so restrictive to be in, in shape and be fit. No, um, it definitely is more restrictive if all you were doing was eating terrible and you know sugary substances, then yeah, then you're probably not gonna want that ever in life, period. It's just not good to have it. Um, but I get to enjoy a lot of things that most people are like, wow, I can't believe you're eating that, you know? Um, but it's because I also burn it off and I like to do activities that are not just me on a stair step or in a gym, which I think is completely ridiculous. Um, but I actually like to ride my bike. I like to go surfing. I like to snowboard. I like to do things that involve my entire body. So anyways, again, not an eBay thing, but it's so, I'm just so into this stuff that I can talk about it effortless, uh, effortlessly. Um, so, all right, what else? Other kind of questions? Man, everyone wants to learn. It's kind of crazy. There's there's <clears throat> at least 30% of the questions are about health stuff. Um, I mean, we can make it a health thing. It's not a big deal. It's just a real adjust the title. All right, any more questions? I'm, I'm still looking for more questions. Oh, here we go. Do I auto relist on your listings? I don't. Uh, when I relist, I sometimes go to five day, up to seven day. It just really depends. And typically when I relist, I'll take anything, but I'll take anywhere between two to five bucks off my prices uh, that are 30 bucks and above, something like that. But I always try to adjust the price a little bit, even though I have a sale that's running as well. So, um, cool. So here we go. Oh, Chris, I have a question from Jenny. Do I eat bananas every day to prevent cramps? Do you eat bananas every day to prevent cramps? I don't. Um, I had a massive leg cramp last night and some of my significant other said I needed bananas. Ha ha. I think honestly, if you want less cramps, period, you got to stay adequately, adequately hydrated with an act with a good amount of electrolytes in your body. Um, and if you go way too low in sodium, that could also be another reason. So yeah, cramps suck. I mean, I get them every now and then, but it's just, uh, I usually just start piling, piling down the water after that. Um, okay. Have I, have you heard about, or have I ever had my eBay store reset? I have not, I don't know what that is. Um, Chris, have you thought about offering custom diet and workout schedules? I have, and um, that's gonna be more on my other channel. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've helped out Raken behind the scenes. I've helped out Eric, college picker behind the scenes. I'm now helping out uh, Ryan Roots from the Rally Roots channel behind the scenes. Um, that stuff takes a crazy amount of time. So um, that, that in my, those are gonna be my most labor intensive time i mean probably labor in intensive and ex most expensive things i think i offer on my channel on my other one but um yeah i i don't having a honed in diet's great i think having custom workouts that rotate every three to four weeks is super super important if you can hone in on your diet and knock it out about 80 percent if you can get your workouts to change every three to four weeks and have someone programming them and changing them um, that's huge. I mean, that's a freaking monstrous part of the puzzle. And then the rest of the puzzle is just have some stress reduction in your life and get some good sleep. Done. <laughs>
everything is done. That's just like the easiest way to attack it. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. Randy at the flip monkeys is it hard. To hit? This is all kinds of health questions. All right. Is it hard for me to hit my macros when I'm intermittent fasting? Look, I don't count macros. I have an idea of what I need to hit every day, but I don't count them. Uh, I don't want, I might, I might start, but it's just not a sustainable thing. I don't think people should go through their lives counting macros. I think that's crazy. It takes up too much time, stresses you out. It's no different than getting on the scale every day. Um, which is definitely not healthy for you at all. You should be very comfortable in the way that you look at all. Okay, let me take that back. I wouldn't say at all times, but you should be comfortable in the way that you look based upon the actions that you have done to that present period. So if you're like, yeah, I don't look that good, but it's also because I haven't worked out and I've eaten crappy and someone's wedding was last weekend and I just like threw my diet in the trash. You know, if you can be honest with yourself and look at yourself, be like, I don't look that good. That's okay. I think people look at themselves and they go, I don't want people to say I don't look good, blah, blah, blah. But if it's clearly obvious that, you know, something is has to change, then that's a different story. I don't know how to explain it very well, but it's really hard to explain without someone appearing condescending, which I'm not. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking good is, while people might be like, that's not important, it actually is pretty important when you go in front of you know serious business people or opportunities in life looking good and taking care of your physical health is very very important that's you know how they say first impressions like matter the most um that matters a lot i mean that's just i don't know how to explain it i can honestly say that the fitness and the working out has helped me get into every poor every piece of my life has been directly affected by my fitness somehow whether it's the people that I've met, the connections I've made in life, where I've been, what I've done. I mean, it's all been because, hey, he has something together. Like he has good work ethic. Like they can see that. And so I think it's much more powerful than you guys think. And most people are like, yeah, well, it's going to take a lot of you know time to get this or what that. But like the thing is, when I was training with my workout partner and he's going to be with me next week, it only took a month and a half before people in the gym were like, hey, man, your arms are looking way more toned, looks awesome. And like his morale got all boosted and everything. So you need to get to that first kind of uh, you need to get over the first roadblock, which is your own limiting beliefs. And you need to get to that first accomplishment, which is the outside public saying something positive about you, whether it be a family member going, hey, you're looking pretty good. Like you're looking like you've lost some weight. Like that's a good thing. You've got to get to that. I think a lot of people sell themselves short and they never make it to that first stage because their own internal walls get in the way and they just basically, you know, self-sabotage themselves. So anyways, but yeah, it is important to look good. Um, yeah. Philip Voyer, I guess, uh, says it right. If you love yourself, others are more likely to love you too. I guess, I guess that's the right way to put it. Opportunities definitely come much more, in a flowy kind of fashion, just like just flows out at you when you have one of the hardest things to achieve in life already done, right? Just like when people have wealth, it attracts people. How did you do it? You know, oh, can I work under you? That'd be great. Um, when you have fitness, it's the same thing, except it's what I believe it's way more crazy, right? It's way more people like there's way more respect involved. Um, yeah, it's just people ask you all kinds of crazy questions and like, how much do you bend? What's, what are your supplements? Are you on steroids? Um, you know, show me some correct form on this. It's really, really crazy what happens. You would never believe it, but I'm just being honest with you. Okay. <laughs> never more antiques. Your gym partner hit the lotto. I guess he did. But he also does some of the filming and all that kind of stuff. So while I am giving forward a lot of what I know, the caveat is that he does have to help with the filming. Um, okay. Can you buy something on sale, then sell it when the price goes back up? Can you buy something on sale, then sell it when the price goes back up? Explain that real quick, Rich. I would love to help you out. Um, OGC would love to have a bona fide workout program. They're coming, man. I'm telling you, they are coming. They're tough. To, they're tough. Um, I just want the best of the best on my channel. The only problem is it's really hard to find the best of the best. So uh, I'm going to, we'll see. Uh, Buffalo Shark Reseller, I checked out your fitness channel. It's great. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you subscribe to it. Uh, Michael W., I answered that question 
uh, earlier, do I not care about being a top rated seller? I do care about it. I just lost it for a month. What I've speculated to be one month. So not a huge deal to me. I, it's not that I don't care. It's that there's nothing I can do about it right now. Un unless there's nothing I can do about it right now outside of shipping on time and making sure everything is, you know, as truthful as it can be. And if there's any kind of, um, you know, <clears throat> something's not right, going immediately to the buyer, be like, hey, let me take care of that for you real quick. Send that thing back to me right now. The second it hits my doorstep, I'm going to refund your money. Or in some cases, if the item is really not worth a whole lot, I'll just let them keep the item. Now, let's talk about my most current return on eBay, which happened last week. Uh, a Patagonia backpack that I bought at Salvation Army for $3. Uh, I took an offer for 65 bucks, shipped it out. And it was really clear on the pictures that there was a little bit of yellowing on the white backpack. There's a little bit of just natural wear and tear. But the thing about it is the Patagonia backpack, there's just really not that much wear and tear. The outside material is very nice and waxy looking. In fact, uh, my Patagonia backpack is actually in the other room, but it has a really nice, almost like a rubber coated top to it. And cosmetically, it changed a little bit of color in certain spots. It was just a little yellow. It had a little bit of yellowing, not like Super Nintendo yellowing, but it had a little bit, but you could see it clearly in the pictures. So the guy gets the product, he immediately emails me. He's like, I cannot use this pack, which I think was like, oh my God, that's so stupid. Like you can clearly use the pack. It is structurally fine, but I'm not going to sit there and fire back with that. Right. I go, okay. Cause I clearly, he doesn't want the thing. So I said, send it back to me. I'll pay for return postage, which was eight bucks and uh, send it back to me. Not a pit, not a big deal. The second, I'm sorry about that. You know, apology, apology. I know what it feels like to be in your shoes, but I'm going to tell you right now that, you know, I'm going to take care of this thing and we're going to get you back to square one super fast. All right. So uh, his next response to me after that was like, man, you, you respond really quickly. That's amazing. And so now I hit my front doorstep within 30 minutes of that thing on my front doorstep. I was already back refunding the money. I put it back and relisted it up for sale. It sold for $69.99, which is $5 more than what it sold for the first time. And I just uh, kicked it out the door today, like an hour before the show started. So, you know, I ended up making maybe exactly 50 bucks on that deal. Once everything was all said and done, I probably made it 50, but that's my most current return. And it's the way I handled it. Um, you tell me if that's a bad way to handle it. I don't see any other way. I don't try to convince people like, are you sure you don't want, you know, I don't try to defend. Um, I suppose if it was a $2,000 item or a $1,000 item, I would be a little worrisome and might think scam, scam, scam. But usually when I get into those higher grade items, I am putting 20% restocking fee, um, you know, returns within the shortest window possible. Um, yeah. And I'm taking pictures of every identifying mark known to man uh, and putting serial numbers down to make sure that doesn't happen or I'll do local pickup. So, um, but yeah, that's my most current return. I mean, returns, I don't even, I'm not even going to say they suck. You know why? Because that's part of business. If you're sitting there like returns suck, ugh, sucks, eBay sucks. Like, look, don't get on eBay then. All right. If you don't want returns, don't go on eBay. Just sell locally for the rest of your life, which would really suck. Um, so yeah, eBay is a great tool. It's an amazing thing to be able to take an item and for 13% of the final cost, which would be PayPal fees plus your eBay final value fees. So for 13% plus postage, you can market this item to millions of people across the country. Think about that for a second. Even across the world, if you have the GSP program enabled, <clears throat> where are you going to get that reach? You know, if some people freak out about eBay, it's like, dude, are you serious? It's unbelievable, like how amazing the opportunity really is. It's completely unbelievable. So, yeah, I mean, people are like, oh, well, listing sucks. I'm like, yeah, it really doesn't suck if you're buying the right items, right? Because listing is actually really good if you buy the right items. Because then it's almost like, let's see if I was as good as I thought I was when I bought this item. Let's see if my estimates were correct. Um, so I think it's more of a test of your knowledge um, it's definitely a test of your execution if you can list um, on a regular basis. I'm not going to say immediately because I don't do immediately, but on a regular basis, that's one thing I need to improve on uh, is to do an everyday like five to, five to seven item list kind of thing. Um, but that's something I need to improve on. Because that's tough to do. It really is, especially on the weekends. Um, anyway, do I normally pay for the return shipping? Look, if I'm at fault, yes. Um, I can tell you a story. Joe Molina, it's a really good one. Uh, Matt Mel Meldrum, do I share my eBay store name? I do. All the people in the green room know what it is. Um, but if you want it behind the scenes, let me know. I'll give it to you. Um, 
Okay, so there's an interesting question here from Joe Molina. Tell us a story about a crazy yard sale. Okay, so I was gonna make a video about this, but I'll, I'll do one right now. <clears throat> this is not a crazy yard sale, but, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you two stories. One, I, I did have the vlog open for this one, so if you remember it, if you're a diehard Bonafide Hustler follower, you might have remember, remember this one. But I went to a garage sale, the whole garage sale was day, day was done. Imani and I are back from getting tacos, we're having fun. We realize there's one garage sale by the house left, and it's like 11 o'clock. So we travel to the garage sale, which is two miles down the road from my house. Um, and we turn the corner, we pull up to the garage sale, and it's like the whole front yard has stuff in it. And it's all badass stuff, like all super cool stuff. Um, so I'm already like just getting all pumped up because not only do I have now carbs in my body, right? I'm not starving anymore. Um, I just see all this really good stuff. And I'm like, holy crap, like, I, I got to get in there. So I like walk across the street, and Emai is there across the street, and I am just taking thing after thing and putting it in this giant pile. I'm like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Um, and uh, this guy, while I'm hunched down, bringing items into a pile, I hear in my ear, like really close, uh, this person goes, I watch your videos. And so, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, but I turned around and I, there was a subscriber there who was throwing the yard sale and he's like, I'll make you a crazy deal on everything, blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, cool. And I think I only paid like 20 or 30 bucks for everything. And I picked up 10 different things. Uh, one thing specifically on Amazon sold like a week later for like 57 bucks. That was just one of the 10 things. Everything else was amazing. And he gave me a really cool firework, which I haven't blasted off yet, but I thought that was pretty interesting. While not a crazy story, definitely one of those weird things you know when you're amassing all this stuff you're like i'm gonna make all this money and then you get this words in your ear i watch your videos that was pretty cool um another one i'll give you another story this probably occurred four years ago five years ago i was at a garage sale and i was picking up some really cool rare uh cycling bibs and jerseys that were ferrari not for made by ferrari but ferrari was one of the sponsors of the cycling team that it was on so i don't know what that team was or whatever but it was clearly italian uh the colors were kick-ass um there was a pair that was out of like bibs and jersey there was a pair that i could hold and touch and everything like that and then there was another pair that was in plastic like untouched just sitting there you know new and i pick it up and i'll ask the lady i was like how much for this stuff and she goes um 10 bucks and i was like okay cool i'll totally get that so i put it in my hands and i keep walking around the garage a little bit and uh this other lady behind me uh goes this other lady behind me goes looks at that she goes oh those are pretty cool and she looks at the other lady she goes i'll give you 20 for those things and i looked at like i just had the dumbest look on my face i was just like okay and the lady looked at me and she goes i have to sell them for more i'm sorry and so i handed them over I didn't find anything else in the garage sale. I walked out empty handed. I felt like an idiot, but I don't know why I felt like an idiot. Uh, maybe I should have just paid quickly. But to me, it was just like, okay, this is a $10 jersey thing that I'm going to sell for a hundred bucks. Like that's all, that's all I was going through my head. It wasn't like this is a $10 thing that's going to sell for 500 bucks. And in that case, I probably would have paid really clearly, I mean, really quickly and gotten the hell out of there. Right. But it was just like a 10 to a hundred dollar flip, like nothing crazy here. And so I wasn't like ready to move and like get out of there. I thought it was pretty crazy. So anyway, uh, Buffalo Shark reseller, your cut for the CD shoes I just sold. Thank you. Oh, cool, man. That's pretty awesome. Uh, thank you. So that $10 super chat from Buffalo Shark reseller. Hey, Buffalo Shark, that's going to my surfboard. I appreciate that. I'm telling you guys in July, more than likely July, if not definitely August, there's going to be a vlog. It's going to be in California. I'm taking you guys with me. We are going to thrift in California, all of us. We're all going to go down there and thrift, taking you with me on the vlog. And uh, we're going to have some fun. I am buying the surfboard on camera. It's going to be super cool. Um, and then I'm going to surf it. Um, yeah, I can't decide whether I want to get a really nice, buoyant fish-type board, which is a board that can surf a lot of stuff, uh, just not like uh, overhead or like double overhead. It won't be able to do that. I don't think, but it can do a lot of mushy stuff and ma basically California waves, like year round California waves, which are mostly mushy. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's some six and eight footers, but, uh, I've always wanted a fish board, like a really cool fish. So maybe I'll get one. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> 
So I'm glad you guys like those uh, stories. Any more questions, let me know. Yeah, I definitely need to start wearing a camera on my chest to go yard sailing. It would be cool. It would be pretty cool. Um, I'm trying to think what other questions I can give to you. What other <laughs> clearance, Andrew? Any desire to go work out with Carrot Top? No, I think Carrot Top definitely was on the juice. Um, I don't. I don't mess with that kind of stuff, man. I, I do not. I uh, I already have slight asthma, which is super slight. Like it never comes around. But uh, you know, you're dealt certain cards in life. And I feel like when you start getting to that black market uh, synthetic star steroid stuff, when you're dealing with fitness, like not that I do it, but uh, a lot of people now on Instagram do it. A ton of people do it. It's an easy way uh, to shortcut the gains, but it's not a way to sustain it. So anyways, um, but I think you're really almost playing with your physiology at that point. You're all, you're basically doing like the X-Men thing. You're turning yourself into a little X-Men for a while, but there's always something that goes wrong in the back end so and there are plenty of, there are plenty of people now that are starting to have heart problems that were big bodybuilders back in the day um there are plenty of people that are not big bodybuilders but, but now that are just aesthetic amazing people that do this crazy crazy stuff that is just concocted in labs it's not even normal natural stuff anymore it's just artificial steroids and people are taking this stuff all over the place it's crazy i cannot believe it. i see it in my gym um, it's sad. It's sad, but that's just what it is. Some people maybe don't value their lives or the future, you know? So I don't know. It's tough to say. It's tough. Uh, I'm never going to not say that I wasn't tempted at one point, but, uh, at this point I've with enough programming and enough attention to my diet and all that kind of stuff. I don't really see a reason to do it. So ever because I'll just work hard and that's just the way I'll do it. And I've been accused 5 billion times of taking stuff. So I figured that's pretty good. That means why would I take stuff? If I'm already getting accused for it, I may as well just keep doing what I'm doing, right? Um, what's up, Thrift Bites? Uh, okay, more info on the shoe guide. Hey, Jennifer, I never said I was making a shoe guide, did I? We will see. Um, Hugh G, have I ever met rude garage sales sellers? Yeah, I have. I once asked for some discount on some yard sale stuff, and the lady said she would rather throw them away. I was so bad and felt humiliated. Look, don't ever feel humiliated. When someone gets that low and that crazy, that's their life crumbling to pieces. There's no reason why your life should start crumbling to pieces as well. Now, I get it. It's just a reaction, human reaction. Like when you get rejected and it's in a public place, it kind of sucks. But then again, you have to reflect and go, man, something really bad must have happened to that person or that party in the morning for them to act like that. Because normal human beings don't do that kind of stuff. So don't ever feel bad about it. The worst thing is to lose your cool when someone lost their cool on you. Like if someone loses their cool on you, not a big deal. As long as they're not physically harming you or your family or your property, I say let them do their thing, right? Because those kind of actions are the action actions of – I hate to say it, but it's very, very low class. It's like not good. It's not a good thing to adopt. So, um, yeah, just be real careful because it's easy to get wound up in that kind of stuff. Sometimes in YouTube drama, it was, people just get wound up in this dumb drama stuff, and it's crazy. It it blows my mind how some people are willing to risk their channels and all their hard work to get in on some of the drama. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me, and it doesn't. Even, it's just YouTube reseller drama. You resellers are nobody on YouTube for the most part. I mean, if you look at the big channels. And you look at resellers like the, you know, just the biggest channels are cruising at 4 million, 10 million subscribers. And maybe the biggest reseller channel might be 100, maybe 80, you know, okay. So in the grand scheme of things, like the reseller, the reselling niche is kind of nothing, right? So why get wound up about nothing? It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, it makes no sense to me. So anyways, okay. <laughs> Brandon Sheely, when people inject synthol, looks ridiculous, plus no extra strength. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's insane. Um, <laughs> when you see Bonafide's shoulder explode, you'll know that he's on good gear. No, I mean, my shoulders are pretty decent. They're not bad, you know, but uh, I don't need any good gear for that. I'm good the way I am right now. I really am. Um, Tori Lope, maybe Tori Lopez or just Tori Lope. You often talk about optimizing your keywords for your items. How do you do that? That's a really good question. This is a fantastic question. This is one of the biggest games in eBay or the biggest learnings off eBay that 
I think you need to learn that. If you're in a beginner or an intermediate or even an expert and you're not on the keyword game, you're just cutting yourself short, I would easily say by 20 or 30%. So what is keyword uh, research? It's not even keyword research, right? When you have an item that you are about to pull the trigger on at a thrift store or a garage sale, um, and maybe you don't know too much about the item, but you know it's valuable. You heard it from some other YouTuber or something. Like you're like, all right, I, I recognize this thing, but I don't quite know if I should be buying it or not. All right, so let's just say that the item is a tennis racket. It's an Encode Wilson Encode tennis racket, uh, carbon tennis racket, one ten head size, uh, four and three eighths grip. Right. All right, so it's a Wilson Encode. You look it up on eBay. And it's five dollars sitting in your hand. You don't know if you want to throw down five bucks for it, but uh, you remember it from somewhere. So you look it up on eBay, Wilson Encode Carbon Racket 110, and that's about it. Now, the thing about eBay to get the best keywords is not to be super, super descriptive about your item when you're typing it in for research. That's really important because in the case of the racket, if you put Wilson Encode Black um, Tennis Racket, um, something else, let's say uh, four and three eighths grip size. You put all this information, guess what? When you press send and you sort by highest, there might only be one or two because those are the only two that match exactly those words that you've been putting in down to the grip size and everything. So what you want to do is put in Wilson Encode Racket. Keep it really, really simple, all right? Press send. It's going to be a bunch of data of current listings. You're going to want to whittle it down to what's sold in used status. Why used? Because you're looking at a used item. There's no sense in even looking at new ones when the used is sitting in your hands. If it was a new racket wrapped, then yeah, you would want to look new. But that is like 95% of the chances, 95% of the time when you're at a thrift store or a garage sale, you're probably going to deal with, be dealing with used items. So you look up the item, you sold, your, you sold by, uh, you uh, whittle it down to the sold by um, highest and used. And then from those top five, maybe top three out of, let's say, 30 results, you want to be pressing the sell similar or have one to sell now, yes, and press that button because all it does is it imports all those keywords into your future listing, okay, whatever you work on. And you back out whatever keywords you don't agree with or doesn't you know, pertain to your racket and you optimize, all right, because sometimes the top ones don't have all the keywords. And today when I was putting in um, – as I'm sorry, when I was making listings, I mean, I was optimizing keywords left and right. Like for a, a backpack that was one of the top sold ones on pre-owned, I pressed sell similar, right? Or sell one like this, whatever it's called. <clears throat> I pressed it and imported all the keywords and then it was missing the color, which is, you know, there were still eight characters left. There was eight characters left and it was missing the color. So there's one you gotta put in right there. That's a pretty important word. They always say that model, right? Make, model, color, application, right? Because if the backpack's like a hiking backpack, shoulder pack, for example, then, or if the tennis racket is like tennis racket, head size, um, color, composition, whether it's carbon or is it, you know, any of the other compositions out there, but you gotta be putting all those things in there. So even the top ones might have uh, holes in them to where you can optimize it with better keywords. So just think about that. If you ever see something that says like, look, and I even do this sometimes. I'll put super condition, which I should I should stop doing that. But sometimes when I'm just out of keywords completely, I would just put something stupid like that. But if you see look or any of those kind of things, uh, you know, great condition, hardly used. Most people are never typing those things into eBay ever. So those are just garbage keywords, right? You want to put in high high value keywords that are gonna take people that are searching for anything remotely close to that. Encode Wilson racket. <clears throat> if someone just puts black Wilson racket, then yours might come up just because yours says black, it says Wilson, and it says racket. Even though it's an Encode carbon, four and three eighths grip, um, you know, 110 head size. You see what I'm saying? So you really have to put in as many keywords and smoke the whole thing up. You should never have any characters left over um, at the end of that. So I hope that explains it kind of. Yeah. It's, it's, you should never be creating a listing from your own just free time, right? A blank listing with nothing populated, I don't ever, ever do that, ever. So anyways, I hope, let me know if that makes sense, okay?
but yeah, when you are searching sold items, be vague. All right. Don't be super, 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 super specific because then it only hits those keywords that are specific to whatever you wrote in. And that's not good. So you want to keep it really, really low. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> all right. So this is one, I'll give you an example today. I was listing some Irish setter boots and I put, there were Irish setter hunting boots, 800 gram insulation, mossy oak slash real tree camo, waterproof, um, new, okay, without tags. So that's what the boots were. When I was looking for comps, all I typed in was Irish setter hunting boots. That was it, right? And they spat me out like a ton of stuff. <clears throat> and also the model number, but I didn't put that. I put the model number only after I found it um, coming up in solds and all that kind of stuff. But you, you have to go in vague to find in all the listings. Then you sort by highest, and then you grab the one the highest one. You grab the keywords from the highest, you know, one to five listings. Um, Bobby Showen, do you put keywords only in the title or in the description also? I only do the title. Uh, what's up, Bro Science Hustler? Are you in the, oh, there you are, man. Uh, should we copy and paste the title and use it for beginning of description? Uh, I don't do it, but I don't see why it would hurt. I just don't see why it uh, would help. Usually when my description usually leads off with the sentence or sentences that's in the condition report, which is right under the drag down menu of new, new other, new without tags or pre-owned, if you select pre-owned, this other box comes up that's called like condition description, I think, or something like that. And I take that and I put in, in great shape, see pics. So then I copy that in my actual description, I put in great shape, in great shape, see pics, very light use. Um, take a look at all the pics and judge for yourself. You can also enlarge pics if you want to. I'll put something like that. Free shipping, continental USA, done. Like that's basically it. Um, Hey, try Chris, you're the man, Ba. Thank you, man. Buoy. Sometimes I just feel so ever overwhelmed when I go to garage sales. There are many items I think might be worth it. I do. I don't want to take my phone and search in front of them. How should I deal with this? This is a really good question. Um, see, I have my brother there. He's a little bit more of a distraction, uh, not for me, but for the people that are, you know, at the garage sale. And uh, but we we really don't. We're so I guess fast with our phones that we can whip out the Amazon seller app and be right on the barcode scanner thing and just, I mean, do it all. It's a simple turn of the body. Bam. We, we hit the barcode. We turn back around. They can see, they can see us again. And now it looks like we're just texting a friend. So I don't know. We do it discreetly, but we really do not care too much about what people think. I would say out of 50 garage sales, I might have had one that was like, Oh, so you scan to resell on Amazon. I mean, that's literally what this, that one lady said. I remember exactly where I was. And I was like, yeah, you know, I have an Amazon business. I try to send some things off here and there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and I was like, it's a pretty day for a garage sale. I decided to come out. And then she started talking about the weather. And I was like, sweet. Like, I'm totally off that subject now. Like, you don't have to talk about the odd scanning thing anymore, right? But I, I pivot pretty quickly. And I don't know. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. It's just, but I also think that, Part of it maybe has to deal with the fact that my brother, I hate to say this, but I'm just going to say it, but some of it has to deal with the fact that my brother and I are maybe a little intimidating, a little bit, you know? And so sometimes people get kind of weird when we come out of the truck. I don't know. They're not weird, but they kind of, you know, like they kind of stop for a second. So uh, I, I just know that for a fact because I just know, I, without saying any more, like I just know that happens for sure. <laughs> Chris, with your body and body and hair, I don't think it could be discreet. I know, I try to be discreet. Um, I try. Uh, Bobby is showing, I'm learning a lot today. Thanks, Chris. You're so welcome. Uh, nose picker, <laughs> nose picker, that's pretty funny. Uh, intimidating AF, that's pretty funny. Uh, I don't intimidate, it's just the way, you know, I just, the way my brother and I carry our, uh, we just, People know that we're, when we come to the, their garage sales, they, they look at us and they're probably like, oh, they're looking for, you know, really active stuff and this and that. Um, we don't have any weights in this garage sale. Probably what they're thinking. Um, but people in Austin are really nice too. Like that's another thing. So 
I feel like Austin is one of those really weird towns where people are not on some high horse, you know, people treat everyone very equally. Um, and if someone asks me, uh, the only time that we sometimes make up a story, not sometimes, but nearly all the time is when someone goes, Oh, so the bikes for your daughter, you know, like when we're buying a kid's bike in your garage sale. Uh, yeah, that's when we uh, have to make up something. It sucks, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> Treasure Hustlers. Hey, Chris. Yeah, you're still alive. Lucky us. Yeah, what's up, Treasure Hustlers? Good to see you two girls. Um, Paula Sheck, how old are you, Chris? I am 39. Um, okay, let me see what else is. <laughs> oh, yeah, Debbie Porter says, I'd be offering you a cocktail if you came to mind. Sweet. Uh, here, in, here in Austin, Texas, it's not uncommon to have garage sales that have coffee, lemonade, uh, donuts, uh, alcohol sometimes, uh, sometimes Lone Star beer. And we went to a, one that did martini. Is it martinis or margaritas? I don't know. And then we went to one that had Bloody Mary's, which was like really good. Um, anyway, yeah, 39, man. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Nose Bigger. Okay, so Sick 3 Retro. Any, are they, any other people reselling cars? I feel like I'm the only one. No, I mean, I've resold cars before. Um, but I don't know. I'm just into reselling this stuff. I just like doing what I do. Uh, I've done it before though. Not, not like on a crazy, crazy level, but I've done it. Um, yeah. So Heather Smith reseller is saying, Heather Smith reseller is asking, I guess saying something here. Hold on real quick. Let me make sure I get this. It's the same as like you acting like you sent the test messages to your spouse or friend at a garage sale. That's right. When you whip out your phone, most people have no clue what you're doing at a garage sale um, regarding FBA or scanning a barcode for eBay. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. When, when people are on their phones like this and they're at a garage sale and if you go like this a bunch, like most people think you're just texting. Like how do you, I could go like this, right? And just have the, the Amazon seller app open and go like that and just have the item here. And it kind of looks like, you know, I'm, just texting someone. So there are a lot of ways you can be discreet. I think the worst thing to do is to become freaked out about it to where you don't do the scan. And that scan could literally be the difference between you making a hundred bucks at that garage sale, 200 bucks, uh, you know, so you have to do the scan. It's really important. Uh, any more questions? I'll give, I'll do five more minutes real quick. All right, we're up in Fort Worth. Sweet. All right. Any more um, oh yeah, I'll ask you guys a question right now. So who knows what the next guide's gonna be? Let me know. Let me know. I know you're listening right now, 119 viewers. Good to see y'all. Do you guys enjoy the hot shots? Let me know that too. Uh, yesterday on my ride-alongs, I was, uh, I'll say it, I was kind of bitching about this thing called pample mousse or pample mousse, whatever. It's just LaCroix flavor and come to figure out by my knowledgeable subscribers that that word is actually French for grapefruit, but still it doesn't make a bit of sense because why would La Croix be called La Croix when they're using French grapefruit terms, which should be called La Croix. Anyway, so it still doesn't make much sense to me. <laughs> oh man, you guys are like loving the videos. I see so many video references right here. Um, I think people figured out what the new uh, guide is going to be. So yeah, never more antiques. Thanks, Chris. Can't wait for you to get the surfboard. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Going to get it. Uh, Janet Doyle, uh, how much of your business is your booth? <clears throat> I would say, of my resale pie, it's probably five percent, maybe ten. It's not very much. Um, the booth is just something that's on cruise control that I started up six years ago, five years ago. I got the infrastructure there. I got the pegboard and everything the way I wanted it. And now I just drop things off at it. Right now it's running a 50% off sale because I need to like really churn and burn some of this inventory out um, before August, which is when the next round of neighborhood wide garage sales will be probably September. Could be October. I don't know. It's just whenever the weather turns here in Austin, Texas and strays away from these 100 degree days, then you start seeing the neighborhoods popping again for neighborhood wide garage sale season. Right now, we're in neighborhood wide garage sale season, but I think we're nearing the very end of the first part of it. So there's always a second part in the fall. And I would like my booth, which is not at capacity right now, but it's getting pretty full. Um, and I'm okay with a 50% off sale considering most of my item, the most expensive item in that booth right now that stands in that booth is a $125 table 
I think you'll see that on the video soon. Um, and below that is an adding machine that is 20 bucks and everything else below that is like five bucks and, and less. So uh, at a 50% off sale, I'm still making good money. Um, and it does thin out my inventory, which is super, super important. Uh, Ryan Rage, dumbbell curls or straight bar curls? That depends on what you want or what your physique goal is. Because while you, there might be, while, okay, so it just depends on what your physique goal is. If your physique goal is get ripped and get jacked and get defined and you're already in good shape, you probably want dumbbell curls. But if your goal is I want to start looking big, I want to start getting in shape, and I want to start, you know, really putting size on my arms, then you want to be on barbell curls because that's just a more comprehensive, all full body kind of movement. Whereas a dumbbell curl is a little bit more swaying involved. You can do it seated. And uh, yeah, it's a lot more contracted, contractual based, I guess. Is that That's not even a word. But anyways, um, yeah, it's hard to explain. But yeah, it, they're two different things for different goals, basically. Uh, Hawaii Entrepreneur Podcast says straight bar hurts your wrist. Not if you do it right. You just have to know how to do it right. But straight bar will build some of the best mass foundation in that area for biceps. So you don't want to you don't want to neglect it. But there comes a point where you don't want your arms to get that much bigger. You just want them to get more defined, and then you start going into the more dumbbell stuff. Uniquely me, that table is fire. Yeah. I don't know if I put out the video. Have I put the video? Have I put out the video where I found the big table yet? Yes or no? Let me know. I don't think I put out the video yet. The other table, not the table that I got from the Salvation Army, by the way, the one I got from the garage sale. I don't think I think that's still in my lineup on YouTube. I haven't made it active yet. But uh, yeah, I got this other table that's really cool. Uh, a question, Chris, what is your favorite Filipino food? That would have to be lumpia. That is amazing. Lumpia is the best. Janet Doyle, yes, what is your day job? Um, I am a, I'm an entrepreneur. This is what I do. So I do YouTube videos. Um, I do, yeah, I do YouTube videos. I create guides, right? I, uh, so yeah, YouTube videos, create guides, sell on eBay. I sell locally. I sell on the antique booth. Um, I am one of the creators of the green room. So there's all kinds of stuff involved there. I get merch money too uh, for things that I have created in the past. Um, what else we got here? My dogs are barking. All right, so one last question. I'm only going to do one last question. Oh, here, here it is right here. Uh, Master Picker, Fred Falcon Eddie One. Do I eat at Franklin's Barbecue? I just had it a week and a half ago. I want to come up to Austin just for that. Uh, it's worth it. Franklin's Barbecue is amazing. But if you do come to Austin, please hit me up on Facebook and maybe I can uh, get you a dopio or something like that. That would be really cool. Here's a good, here's a good question. Ethan uh, Ducre or Duker, I guess. Um, why don't you go to more estate sales? Because you're in a place where people have done a fair amount of research on uh, eBay and solds and worth points and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what I say a estate sale company is, right? It's a bunch of semi-professionals that go into a place. It's a turnkey option for a person that wants to let go of an estate and all the stuff inside of it to a company that's probably going to take anywhere between 40 and 60% of the proceeds. But still, they're going to, it's in their best interest to look up the items so they can make more money, right? So that's essentially what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a little bit better level grade of hustler. Uh, while not, I can still make money on estate sales, right? I just find myself in Austin, Texas with more opportunities just doing garage sales and thrift stores. So that's the bottom line. Now, if it's a rainy day or the inclement weather comes through and it's all cold and all effed up, then yeah, I might go to some estate sales, but I feel as if also estate sales have a lot more competitors, um, whether you be a bookseller or a person that scans through the CDs, there's just a lot more, there's a lot more competition there. And it's not that I'm afraid of competition. It's just like, well, if this other avenue right here, which are just garage sales and thrift stores, has barely any competition, why would I go to a place that has competition where the people have looked up the items? So it doesn't make much sense to me. Um, nose picker, do I miss Circuit City? Uh, yeah, I do. It's actually, that was a really fun job. I really enjoyed it, honestly. Um, Silver hair stacker, how important is a retirement savings for resellers? I think it's important, A, to have an asteroid fund, and then B, 
any remaining money at least get your IRAs in check for the year because that's important. Um, but yeah, have an asteroid fund is something that just like if the AC blows up in your house or something like that, then maybe that's 6K right there. If you don't have 6K liquid ready to go, then you have a problem. So you want to get your asteroid fund done. Uh, that way, if anything happens or a car repair or something, then you have the money to do that. And it's not affecting your purchasing habits um, or how your business might run. So very important, asteroid fund before IRA fund. Yeah, it's called asteroid. Like if an asteroid comes out of you know the, the sky, no one knows where it's going to hit, but sometimes they come out and they just crash in, and it's just life. Basically, it's a life fund, you know. But we call it asteroid fund. Um, <laughs> Clarence Ninja competition is for dummies. Mark Cuban. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of being a creator. Honestly, um, I really think that the next stage of my development. Uh, not so much really related to YouTube is just to really help a bunch of people on the fitness scale. Like, um, yeah, I was at the gym two days ago and I was just doing something and I saw out of the corner of my eye, someone was coming up and it was a good friend of mine. His name is Norman. And so Norman was a really popular guy in the bar scene back in the day. <clears throat> you know, he was just a really cool guy. That's how I met him. And I've known him and seen him, you know, multiple times throughout the years and he works out at the gym that I work out at. So as soon as I was like saying hi to him, he's like, dude, where can I get the hat, man? I gotta get one of those hats. I wanna support your thing, which is the private label brand that I'm working on. But I was wearing one of the hats and he's like, oh my God, like he's like, I've always loved that hat since the first time I saw it. I gotta have one, let's do a deal. Um, and so we exchanged, you know, text and whatever, but not a big deal. But um, I was uh, seeing him do he saw me doing something like or it's called a reverse tricep press down on a cable machine. He saw me doing it and there's a certain way to do it to where you isolate completely the tricep to where, to where the triceps, the only, only muscle were really, really working. And so he saw me doing it and everything. And then I was over at a calf machine that was looking at the tricep thing. I saw that he had stepped in place and was starting to do it too, except he wasn't doing it correctly. And so I stopped my calf raises and I walked over to him. I was like, look, do it this way. Put your arm here as stabilizing. To stabilize your stuff, you want to lean slightly forward in. You want to make sure this is at that angle. And then you want to, you know, retract your scapula, push your chest out. And then by that, mo only in that moment, only at that moment, do you start doing the exercise. And if you do it just right, nothing else should be moving except for the, the lower part of the arm. And so he started doing it. He's like, damn. He's like, and I saw him go to the, the, the weight stack and he had to move the pin into a different position because once you realize how to do something correctly, you realize, holy crap, I've been trying, all these other muscles have been recruited to do what I thought I was doing correctly, but I wasn't recruiting the tricep solely. And so when I just isolated everything down to just the tricep, he had to move the pin to a much lower weight because he was like, wow, now I see what you were doing. So I need to take that same mentality and spread it across tens of thousands of people somehow. And that's my next evolution of what I'm going through. And so that's the reason why there's a private label brand behind it too, that I already concocted up about a year and a half ago. And so right now it's almost, it's almost done and we're getting into the very last stages of it. So we'll probably be seeing a little bit more of that, but you have seen some of it on my videos already. So everyone kind of knows what it's about. And uh, yeah, I think that's really fun. I, I'm really, I really thought about hard about what I really care in life about. And it comes down to, uh, probably four things. One is experiences. Um, it comes down to just really cool experiences. Not so much even really traveling per se, because I love traveling, but I don't have to be like, oh, I'm going to Indonesia. Like, I'm cool. Like, I don't have to do that to feel that great. I have to just be active and travel and be able to fly down mountains on a mountain bike and carve up snow, you know, whether it be in Montana or Utah. Like, I want to be able to just, as my body is very healthy still, I want to be able to just take care of every experience possible until my body breaks down. So that's super, super important to me. So experiences, level one. Um, the second thing is I want to impact a lot of people by the thousands. Like that's really important. I think I've accomplished that with my reselling uh, thing, but I haven't quite accomplished that with my physique, fitness, love, you know, love for fitness and physique stuff. So I haven't done it yet. So that's a big burning hole. Like if I was to know that I was going to die in like six months, it would kill me to think like I had never took the time to really get that done. So that's another big one. Uh, so yeah, experiences, 
um, helping a bunch of people. Uh, the third thing is surrounding myself with a lot of surrounding myself with a lot of friends and love. So just as simple as bonfires, uh, parties, um, just having a lot of fun and always being around people and friends. I think that's really important. That's super healthy. Anyone that tells you that uh, this lonely lifestyle where you're just an entrepreneur, just working away at turning and burning. I don't, I don't see it. I never will see it. I'm sorry. I don't think it's right. And I'll be the first to just be like, I'm not doing it. Sorry. I find that being around people that you care about, you can reciprocate good feelings and love. I don't know how to explain it, but anyways, so that's the third big thing that I want to make sure. And then the last thing is, um, I'm trying to think what the last thing was. Oh yeah. To always, always find my flow state every day. So if you research flow state, kind of figure out what that is, but I always want to reach a flow state every single day. And that's important because true happiness um, as measured in brain waves is technically only two out of five brain waves, right? There are two brain waves that are stimulated when a person is in complete, complete happiness. And it typically occurs when there's an intense bout of studying or an intense bout of creation involved. Like if I'm creating, that's the reason why I like creating guides. I started realizing like, damn, this is why I really like doing this. It's because I'm creating something that's gonna affect a large amount of people. So you can achieve a flow state through that. You can also achieve a flow state through uh, movement, all right? Movement uh, where your mind's constantly thinking and like, constantly wondering, it's hard to explain, but like if you're a runner, if you've ever run in your life, maybe you're a track, you run it, ran a track, or maybe you were a football player or something, there comes a point in the game or in the run where the need for water, food, sex, and shelter doesn't cross your mind anymore. It's a feeling of euphoria. People call it the runner's high. Um, but yeah, that actually, isn't really even a high. It's a flow state. Your two brain waves are getting, uh, your two brain waves are getting activated. Those two really important brain waves, and so that's the reason why I built this private label brand. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like it actually, the private label brand comes is basically my take on that feeling, and that's what it is. So, anyways, um, and there's another meaning behind it too. But that's essentially what it is because I've been doing that whole thing for three decades of my life. I know for a fact that there is a no better feeling than when I am flying down a mountain or surfing in the ocean of California on, you know, four hours at a time, there's no better feeling. That is the ultimate happiness to me. And most people are like, well, isn't your ultimate happiness like reselling and all this kind of stuff? It's not. Um, I'm just really good at it. Um, but it's not my ultimate happiness. So that's what my future and my evolution will become. I will never not make videos for the Bonafide Hustler channel. Um, if the fitness channel starts doing what it is supposed to do, um, you might see a reduction, but I will never not be a hustler. Like it's just part of my blood. I think it's really important. I see van life in my future somewhere down the road. I really do. And I think to sustain good van life and to make it fun, I think reselling is going to have to be a piece of that picture. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. And I'm, I, you know, so when people are like, oh my God, you're 39, you're old. I've got experiences that will blow your mind already. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to find more. I just want more experiences. I want to affect more people. And if I have a fitness channel and a, a reselling channel, no matter what town in America I go to, I will be able to connect with you guys, um, you know, and provide anything that I know to inspire whatever, you know, my journey. So anyway, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know what else to, uh, to say, but this, this Q and a went from eBay to health to, to all kinds of weird stuff and finally the flow states and now you know where I'm kind of headed. So I hope you enjoyed it um, and I will see you on the next Bonafide Hustler right along, Hustler Life or Hot Shot and should be a lot of fun. Yeah, keep commenting on my videos, keep liking the videos and I'll see you on the next one. Any more questions or comments? Let me see here. Thanks for all your time, Chris the Guru. Thanks, man. Um, yeah. Can I try one more question? If you're fast, man, go for it. Thanks so much, Chris. You're the best. Uh, the fit nurse, will you help us ladies with fitness? Look, my wife is going to be in some of the fitness videos uh, soon, for sure. Um, 
Uh, gonna see Chris on AE someday. I hope so. Hopefully not in a hoarder sense, right? Um, no, no, that would never be me. Uh, what was the uh, do I make more money on eBay or your booth? Oh, eBay for sure. Um, so much knowledge, keep doing live vids. Yeah, once I think what I'm going to start doing from this point forward is maybe do like a fitness Friday or something like that, or or lifestyle Friday. So every Friday, maybe starting tomorrow, I think tomorrow's Friday, we'll do lifestyle Friday. I'll put a post up um, on my bonus fight hustler Facebook, and I'll put a post up on my YouTube channel, not about damn, but my actual bona fide hustler one. And it'll be an open Q and A. That'll be guaranteed questions that I ask or that I answer. So if you see that thing, you know, for Fitness Friday or Lifestyle Friday, then put a question down there, and I'll tr I will. Those will be absolute questions that I answer to with the knowledge that I have. If I don't have the knowledge, I will admit it. I will just be like, I cannot help you right here. Sorry, but that is uh, something I want to be doing uh, Lifestyle Friday because hey, on Friday people are not thinking about freaking business anyway for the most part. You should have your Craigslist stuff all listed and ready to go for the weekend. You should have all your eBay listings in. Take your freaking weekends off, dude. Have fun. You know, hang out with your friends. Uh, get pumped up for Saturday, but don't sit there and kill yourself on a Friday. Friday is a wind down day, um, and you should be having a lot of fun. And you should be focusing on everything that you've ever wanted to focus on outside of business. Friday should just be the day that should be almost like the start of that reward. So, um, cool. So I guess that's pretty much it. I'll see you on the next time. This is like the third time I've said that. I will see you on the next video. I really thank you guys for being here. Uh, if there's any way I can help you guys, you know I'm going to be here for you. So till then, I'll see you on the next video. And maybe it'll be live. Actually, it'll be tomorrow. Okay? I'll see you guys. Bye.